Okay. Questions about what we did yesterday? We ended with We ended with doing a doing anti Markovnikov addition of HBr. So in order to do anti Markovnikov addition, I have to add hydrogen peroxide to the mixture. And so once I do that, then we've got a different we've got a different set of answers to the three questions that we said yesterday. Um, how Alex? Do you know what to do? So what you have to do is, and the chart's going to be pretty small right now, but basically if you create a chart that says something like this, reagent, what are you adding? Is it Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? And then is it 50-50 um, cis-trans or is it 100% cis or 100% trans. We could go through the reagents that we have so far, and so you just have to remember those. So if we say, for instance, HX, what am I adding? HX. I'm adding an H and an X. Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? Markovnikov, and then is it 50-50, 100% cis, or 100% trans? Everything we've done is 50-50. Why is it 50-50? Because this reaction goes through what kind of intermediate? A carbocation. And anytime you go through a carbocation intermediate, and I'm going to broaden that out, in a minute, it always undergoes, it's always 50 50 because the groups are going to add 50% on top, 50% on bottom. So you could go through that with each one of these. So if I said HX, H2O2, we're still adding HX, but now how are we doing it? Now we have to remember that we're doing it anti Markovnikov. And so the H goes on the most substituted carbon, not on the least substituted carbon, because it's anti. And then the last thing we need to deal with this is 50-50. It turns out it's 50-50 as well. So you just have to make that chart. And the only other, the only other thing is what? H plus... H2O or H plus with an ROH on it. And there we're either adding an H and an OH or we're adding an H and an OR. Both of those are going to be Markovnikov addition and both of those are going to be 50-50Y because we're going through a carbocation intermediate. So right now we don't have anything that is stereoselective. I guess um, I was really confused at the end of yesterday and trying to figure out um, what kind of questions would you ask yourself like because you started asking questions to kind of go through whether something is stereoselective or regioselective. Do you have like recommended questions? Yeah, we can. I mean, we can we can go through the steps for that. So let's go. So let's go back to this. Let's go back to this problem at the beginning here. So. If so what would be the major product of this reaction? How, how you're going to write that product? 
I'm going to write the molecule without the double bond. Because that's going to be the, that's the skeleton of the molecule. I'm adding two things to the double bond. I'm adding something to carbon A and something to carbon B. Well, what am I adding? Well, if I look at my chart, I'm adding H and Br. How am I adding that? Anti-Markovnikov, so where should the H go? On carbon A or carbon B? Carbon A. So the H will go on carbon A, and the bromine will go on carbon B. And that's anti-Markovnikov? So anti-Markovnikov means the exact opposite of Markovnikov. So remember, Markovnikov is the carbon in the double bond that has the most hydrogens, gets the hydrogen. And anti-Markovnikov is going to be exactly opposite. So that's correct. H would go on carbon A and Br would go on carbon B. Because the bromine is going to add to the least substituted carbon. And and how did that happen? Well, it happened because the mechanism is different and goes through a radical intermediate. This is this is the anti-Markovnikov. The Markovnikov product would be if the Br goes on the most substituted and the hydrogen goes on the carbon with the most hydrogens. So Markovnikov's rule is if you're adding an H+, plus, and we're going to move away from adding H pluses exclusively here in a minute or two. When you add your electrophile, your electrophile has to go to the carbon with the most hydrogens because that will give you the most stable carbocation. But this mechanism is completely different. It's a radical mechanism. So in this case, the radical where the hydrogen's going to add has to go on the carbon with the, that's most substituted. So it's just you're adding H and an X. Okay. So the way so way the way it works is here's the reagent. What am I adding? Yeah. I'm adding H and an X. Okay. So I just put a comma there. When I add H plus H two O, what am I adding? An H and an OH. If I was to do that mechanism with an alcohol, I would be adding an H and an OR. So for this reaction, we've got a Markovnikov product. We've got an anti-Markovnikov product. The presence of the H2O2 means that this reaction goes anti-Markovnikov, and so it's the top product that's the major product. Brandon? If it doesn't have her peroxide, it's Markovnikov. Right, but if it doesn't have peroxide. Then it goes anti. Right, because that changes the mechanism to form radicals. The major is the anti, but the major is the anti. So this is going to there's going to be more anti than Markovnikov. But now, and the last thing we have to do is talk about the stereochemistry, which will be which will actually be relatively easy. So this chart's going to get longer. A 
couple today, a lot next week, if you're here next week. Because this is a long chapter. So we're gonna do we're gonna do as many as as we get to, and then after that we'll finish the rest of them in organic too. Okay, everybody with me? So the major product then of this reaction is the anti-Markovnikov. Is this reaction regioselective? Now, when we're talking about regioselective, we can make a little checklist of whether something is regioselective or not. We could even make a flow chart if you're into flow charts. So what's the first thing that I need to have for regioselectivity? Two, two products. So do we have two products? Yes or no? What happens if we don't have two products? It's not regioselective. If it is, we continue on. So if it's yes, we continue on. Now what do I need to look at? Yeah, we should probably put that up here, two products that are structural isomers. Now, if we ended up with two products that weren't structural isomers, then the answer would be no, and we wouldn't have regioselectivity. So we should probably put that up there. So if yes, we have two possible products. What should be the next thing that we look at? Do we have a major product? And and here's how I would do that. And, you, and this is the kind of stuff where, you know, everybody's going to have their own system of doing this. So if you do whatever works for you. But what I would say is, I would say that, yes, we have two products. Are they 50-50? Then, no, it's not regioselective. Do you have a major product? Then yes, it's going to be regioselective. And we can modify this a little bit because the 50-50 and the major, the major basically is going to mean that the reaction goes by Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. But they will all do that. And we could even slide something in here. We could even put something in here before that. Because remember, an automatic regioselective, regioselective and automatic Automatic no is when you have what kinds of re what kind of reagent? What kind of reagent will automatically mean that there's no regioselectivity? They're symmetrical. So an automatic no would mean that you have a symmetrical reagent. So that means if I'm adding the same thing to both sides, or if the double bond is symmetrical so that it doesn't matter if I add it one way or the other way, I get the same product. Which then gets you to the idea that you have two products. So in the case of the, the, case of the reaction we just did, I'm adding an unsymmetrical reagent to an unsymmetrical alkene. 
I still have to check and make sure that I get two different products. Did I? Yes. Did I get them in 50-50? No, there is a major product. So yes, the reaction has rejo selected. So if you wanted something like you can and you can modify that whatever way you want to modify it. But if you wanted a flowchart with questions, that would be the that would be the way to approach it. Now what about stereo selectivity? Well, if we're gonna talk about stereo selectivity, um, I'm just going to rewrite the reaction. I usually talk about stereo selectivity as far as the major product goes. Because you could make cases in some of these reactions that the minor product might be formed stereo selective but we're just going to talk about the major product being stereoselected. So in this case, this is the major product. What's our, our big problem here? And I would immediately say no. This reaction is not going to be stereoselective. Because in order for a reaction to be stereoselective, what do we have to do? Selectivity means you need at least at least two products, two stereo isomeric products. So in this case, what does the stereo isomeric product mean? It means that it has to have a chiral center. But the problem is, as we learned yesterday, right, if you just have one chiral center, and you don't have a chiral reagent, you're going to make everything 50-50. So one chiral center is not going to be enough to be stereoselective. How many chiral centers does that product have? What? Zero? Is that what I heard? Zero chiral, sh chiral centers? Yeah, it doesn't have any chiral centers. It's not a trick question. You might say, why are you going over new stuff for when we have the final tomorrow? Well, this is on the final. This isn't new. So we're going to be sort of reviewing some stuff as we go through. So there's no chiral center. Remember, CH2s can't be chiral centers. CH2s and CH3s can't be chiral centers. So in this case, there is only one stereoisomer. And so with only one stereoisomer, you can't be chiral. And that's great for this problem, but I want to take it a step further. We have talked about the carbocation, right? The carbocation looks like that. It's got its sp2 hybridized carbon. Will you have to determine um, the hybridization of carbons tomorrow? Or oxygens from exam one? Yes. So when I look at this carbocation, it is sp2. And it always has to be sp2. Now, you could say, okay, what's the difference between a carbocation and a radical? One electron. So a radical actually has an unpaired electron in the unhybridized p orbital. 
and for the most part that radical is going to be sp2 hybridized now there are advanced reactions that are not going to be appropriate for this year for this to these two classes where you could have the the radical as sp3 hybridized but we're not going to deal with those situations the sp2 the radical is always going to be sp2 hybridized so if you think about that last step in the mechanism the last step in the mechanism is to have the radical react with a hydrogen atom actually it doesn't react with a hydrogen atom what it does is it pulls the hydrogen off of the HBr it, it, ab, it abstracts it is the technical term so that radical is going to abstract this hydrogen from HBr well since there's two lobes how's it going to add the hydrogen there's nothing stopping it from adding on top there's nothing preferential about it adding it on the bottom and so what's going to happen is you're going to add it 50-50 50 percent of the time from the top 50 percent of the time from the bottom and so I'm going to add the hydrogen in both positions so it's just like a carbocation the carbocation adds the nucleophile 50 percent from the top 50 percent from the bottom so you end up with that carbon being if it is a chiral carbon it's 50 50 same thing over here if I generated a chiral carbon it would be 50 50 so there's no stereoselectivity in a radical reaction so if I go back to the little mini chart that that we started over here is it stereoselective no it's 50 50 why because it goes through a radical intermediate and then I can broaden my term out and I can say anytime you go through any kind of sp2 hybridized intermediate you will not be stereoselective because you will at best get 50 50. So right now we don't have a reaction that is stereoselective. We know what it means, but we don't have a good example yet. And if I'm going to get an example, if I'm going to make a stereoselective reaction, I'm going to have to use a completely different mechanism. Because a carbocation and a radical are never going to be stereoselective. Everybody kind of with me here? So what can I add? And the whole idea here is I would like a whole collection of reactions that is going to let me add different groups Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, it'd be even better if I could add 100% cis or trans. But for these reactions, I don't have that opportunity. But I can add HX Markovnikov, I can add HX anti-Markovnikov. The H plus H2O, I can add an H and an OH Markovnikov. So what if I wanted to do add H and OH anti-Markovnikov? What should I do? I need a new reagent. And so if I want to add, let's say to this double bond, I want to add an H and an OH anti-Markovnikov, I'm going to change my reagent and I'm going to use BH3 and H2O2. For the moment, when you see H2O2, the reaction is going to be anti Markovnikov. But depending on how far we get, 
that won't necessarily always hold. H2O2 is one of those reagents that shows up a lot and you have to put it in context of what else it's reacting with. So you can't just look at the H2O2 and say, oh, it does this because it does different things in different reactions. So if I do this reaction, I'm now going to add HOH anti-Markovnikov, which means that my product here will have the H and the OH. So I will now be able to add H and OH anti-Markovnikov with this set of reagents. And this is a mechanism that we're going to that I'm going to kind of go through, but it's not one that you'd ever have to be able to reproduce. But a lot of times I talk about the mechanism simply so that if you get stuck and go is this 100% cis or 100% trans? And it's going to be one of those two. Then if I kind of go through how the mechanism works, then you can go back and go, oh yeah, that's right, that's why it was cis. So we've got BH, we've got BH3, H2O2. This is a two-step reaction. The first thing I'm going to do is add the boron to the double bond. Now you might say, all right, how, how's that going to work? Here's how it's going to work. This BH3 would like to add to the carbon that is least sterically hindered for a reason that I will get to. So the boron, the boron is going to end up on the least hindered carbon. So what happens is, is that I, t I can look at this reaction occurring like this. I've got an H and I've got a BH2. Now boron on the periodic table is an element that is less electronegative than hydrogen. So as far as the boron-hydrogen bond goes, the boron is slightly positive while the hydrogen is slightly negative. That's a new feature. We don't have hydrogen very often having a negative charge. And so this, this is actually called boring. But there's going to be other boron molecules that are called borohydride, meaning that the hydrogen has a negative charge. So when I have the molecule looking like this, here's what can happen. I can take this pair of electrons and I can use it to bond what part of the BH bond. Well, since this is a pair of electrons, I'm going to use it to form a carbon-boron bond because the boron is the electrophilic part. Then I'm going to break the boron-hydrogen bond and I'm going to put it, I'm going to use it to bond to that carbon. So if this is carbon A and this is carbon B, then the hydrogen will end up on carbon A and the boron will end up on carbon B. Okay, so the pair of electrons moves from the double bond to the boron because it's delta positive. And this all occurs in one step. So if it occurs in one step, what would the transition state look like? What bonds am I forming? What bonds am I breaking? So what bond am I forming? So the carbon boron bond I'm forming. Well, the two these two hydrogens are going to stay intact, but I am going to break that boron hydrogen bond. I'm breaking the double bond, and what's the last one? I'm forming the carbon-hydrogen bond. So I get a square. So that's what the transition state looks like. And now you're going to say, well, what about the charges? There are no charges. 
There are no charges, there are no full positive or negative charges in the reactant, and there's going to be no for, there's going to be no charge in the final product. So in the final product, my H goes here and my BH2 goes there. The top and the bottom, well, yeah, this is, this, this is forming, this is breaking, this is forming, this is breaking. So basically what you have is you have, here's my alkene as a table, here's my BH2, it's coming down and I'm just adding it right on top of, on top of the double bond. Now, what's critical about this then is that this hydrogen and this boron are going to be cis. They will have added 100% cis. And if I take a step back here, which carbon did the hydrogen which carbon did the hydrogen add to? It added to carbon A, which is the carbon with the least number of hydrogens. And so therefore, that's setting this reaction up to be anti-Markovnikov. If I can do one thing. So this reaction could become anti-Markovnikov and add the hydrogen and the other group 100% cis. Now all I have to do is figure out how to replace that BH2 with an OH where the OH ends up in exactly the same position as the BH2. And that's where the hydrogen peroxide comes in. And that mechanism, I'm not going to go over. I'd, I'd have to make something up. But the peroxide now comes in. So when you now add the H2O2 to this mixture, what happens is, is that the H2O2 replaces the boron with an OH in exactly the same position as the boron was originally. No inversion, no rearrangement, it just replaces the boron with an OH. So that's why this is a mechanism I wouldn't ask you to write out. But I'm showing you the key step, which is the H and the boron are adding 100% cis anti Markovnikov. That's all the time. And the reason the boron is adding anti Markovnikov is because the boron has to add to the boron has to add to the least to the least hindered carbon. And you could think of that just pure sterics. The the molecule would be much lower in energy if the boron, that bigger group adds in the least sterically hindered position. That's actually not ten percent correct. As the book will tell you, the real reason is because actually now, once I add my first boron to the first double bond, I still have two more BH bonds that I can add to two more double bonds. So in the end, I only need a third the amount of boron as alkene because that boron has three BH bonds that's going to go ahead and add to the double bond. So it's going to do this first, then the second BH is going to add to another double bond the same way, and then the third BH is going to add to another double bond, so that in the end I'm going to have the boron attached to three of those groups, and so if I do that, then that forces the boron to add in the least sterically hindered position. You need to know everything. 
But the reason that I'm showing you this is so that tomorrow, when you're, I give you this reaction and say, what's the major product, and you forget, you could maybe go back and say, oh, let's see, the boron, and where does it have to go? How does the boron and hydrogen have to go? They have to add cis. So we should just know yeah. But I'm not going to ask you to draw out this mechanism, but I'm showing it to you as to why we get the products we get. So you're not going to have to draw a mechanism at all tomorrow. Although, I mean, I could say, I could give you a couple of these sort of transition states and say, hey, which one is, which one is more? <coughs> Which one is correct? So the peroxide comes in, replaces the boron. So now what did I added? I added a hundred percent. I had a hundred percent cis, and I added anti Markovnikov. So could this reaction be regioselective? It could, because I'm adding an H and an OH that are not symmetrical. And I'm adding a anti-Markovnikov all the time. So it could be regioselective. Could it be stereoselective? Well, now the, now the guidelines are that in order for me to potentially get a stereoselective reaction, I've got to have a reagent that adds the two groups, either 100% cis or 100% trans. If the reagent doesn't do that, there's no chance of it being stereoselective. What happened with carbocations and radicals? They added 50-50. And so adding 50-50, there was no chance of it being stereoselective. But now there is. Well, if there's no carbocation, that's good for being stereoselective because if there was, it never would be stereoselective. Because if you have a carbocation, you're going to add the groups 50-50. So if you want to make a stereoselective reaction, do not have a radical or a carbocation in your mechanism, which we do not have here. Okay, what's the major product of this reaction? Is it regioselective? Is it stereoselective? Again, how do I approach this problem? I approach this problem by writing out everything but the double bond. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave my bond between the carbon and the CH3 for either a bolt or a dashed wedge. Okay, what am I adding? H and OH. So let's just do this. Let's add the H and the OH there, and let's add the H and the OH here. Because if it's going to be regioselective, what's the first criteria? I need to make two different products, or have the possibility of making two different products. Now this is going to be one of these things where, remember yesterday I said there is no term for 100, 0, for 100% 100 of one product and 0% of the other. So one of these products is going to be 0%. But that doesn't, that doesn't affect whether it's regioselective or not. So I'll write my I'll write my H and OH like that. Okay? Um, and how am I adding the H and the OH? I'm adding them a hundred percent. C 
says. So what that means is that means it doesn't matter whether I use a bold or a dashed wedge, the H and the OH have to go on here with the same wedge. So I'm going to use a bold wedge here. If you want to be different, you can add a dashed wedge. It doesn't matter as long as the H and the OH that I just added are 100% cis. So what should go? So what should the methyl group have? What kind of wedge do I have to give the methyl group? Dashed wedge, both cases. So the methyl group gets a dashed wedge. Why? Because there's two in the plane, one bold, one dashed. So here are my two structural isomeric products. Are they different? They have different names, yes. Is there a major product? And that major product is what? Top or bottom? Top? Do we agree? Okay. So this is the major product. Will any of the other product form? No, but again, for regio selectivity, it doesn't matter if it's 51, 49, or 100, 0. It's all, all the same. So in this case, is this reaction regio selective? Did I make two products that are structural isomers? Yes. Did I select one over the other? Yes. Why did I select one over the other? Because the original molecule was unsymmetrical, and this is anti Markovnikov and I have a major product. So this is regioselective. So I get kind of an idea that you can go under the zero. So when you do these, do you, should we just draw any possible products even if it's in zero? So what you do is you just draw, yeah, so what you do is you just draw adding the two groups this way and adding them this way. And then for stereoselectivity, you would even want to draw them cis and trans and see if they're different products, although you won't have to do that in a minute because I'll show you another way we can evaluate stereoselectivity. But for regioselectivity, you have to write at the first group to that carbon, second group down here, reverse it. Do you get two different products? So even if you know that it's going to be from the so that you can double check and make sure that it is simply because it's the of the possible products not in the hundred zero that other po product is possible even though it's not going to so this is our major product now when it comes to stereo selectivity I've said if you generate a product with one chiral center, is that going to be stereoselective or not? If you just make one chiral center, no. Not without a chiral reagent. Any chiral reagents here? BH3, H2O2 chiral, no. Double bond, not chiral. Not chiral from the standpoint of having a chiral carbon. So, I can't generate one chiral center, but what if I generate two chiral centers? So let's take a look at this major product. There is the major stereochemical product because I added the H and the OH 100% cis. What is the other possible stereochemical product? 
to add the H and the OH trans. And again, that's the possible product. Do I form any of that? No. So I've got 100% of this product, I've got 0% of that product, but again, that adding the H and the OH 100% cis and adding in 100% trans are the two possible ways to add it. Just like adding it this way is one possibility, adding it this way is another. So actually there's four possible ways, four possible products I could get out of this reaction. Adding H top and bottom and adding H and OH cis and trans. Now, Here's my two possible stereoisomeric products for the top react for the top product for the major product. What are they? What is their stereochemical relationship? What are your choices? Enantiomers, diastereomers, same, not meso, same, meso. Not meso, so we can take that one away. Same. No. No. So now, okay, so now we might need a little bit of review here, right? How did we determine, how did we answer this problem? Just like two short weeks ago. How did we, how did we get at the relationships? If they're mirror images, they're going to be enantiomers. Let's talk about configurations of chiral carbons. If both chiral carbons have the same configuration, if both chiral carbons in this set of molecules has the same configuration, they are same. If they have both have opposite configurations, what are they? No. Nantimers. If they're both if they both have opposite configuration, they are nantimers. What happens if you got one same, one opposite? Diastereomers. Is there, can these molecules be meso? No. So what are they? Diastereomers. Because the top carbon is the same. The bottom carbon is not the same. Or opposite. So what are this relationship? Those two are diastereomers. Okay. Basic definition of a stereoselective reaction. Am I forming, for my major product, am I forming two molecules that are stereochemical isomers? Or stereoisomers? Somebody say yes. Yes. So I just formed two stereoisomers. Am I favoring one over the other? Somebody say yes, yes. Am I favoring it 100 to 0? Yes. But that's the same as favoring it 5149. So, do I have two stereoisomeric products? Yes. 
Am I favoring one over the other? Yes. Is this stereo selective? Yes. Right, and they're stereo isomers. So I got more than one stereo isomeric product, so I have more than one product, and then I just need to say, okay, they're diastereomers. So we could go through that tediousness. And we have to go through this tediousness, and we will have to go through this tediousness once we have another dozen reactions we have to learn. And yes, there's another dozen reactions out there. Fortunately, not tomorrow. But there are, there are more reactions. So, is there a simpler, quicker way to get at the answer of whether it's stereo selective or not? Well, we've already said that you, with one chiral center, that's not going to give you a stereo selective reaction, correct? So, I'm going to need how many chiral centers? At least two. So if you generate a molecule, so this is when a reaction will be stereoselective, an alternative definition. Number one, you generate two chiral centers, two chiral carbons in the product. So if there are two chiral centers generated in that product, you could be stereoselective. Number two, if that's true and you added the two groups, 100% cis or 100% trans, then you could still be stereoselective. But then what we should always do is we should always check and just make sure that you actually did make two stereo chemical isomers or stereo isomers. It's always, it's always good to check. The problem here is that the two stereo chemical isomers cannot be enantiomers. So your two stereochemical isomers must be diastereomers. They have to be diastereomers. Because again, you cannot make one enantiomer over the other unless your product, or unless your, one of your reactants is optically active or chiral. And all the reactions we're gonna do, the reagents will not be chiral. So those two stereochemical isomers must be diastereomers. And will you favor one over the other? That's what the 100% cis and 100% trans does. So it doesn't matter how many chiral centers you have. If you make a pair of enantiomers as your product, the only way you're going to get an unequal mixture is if you use the chiral reagent. If you don't use a chiral reagent, then you can't make a chiral product. And but what I mean by chiral reagent and chiral product is a reagent that rotates plain polarized light. And what I mean by the product is a product that rotates plain polarized light. So an unequal mixture of R and S. And that's not even correct. It should be an unequal mixture of D and L. Because in this case, I made two. I made a D and an L. I don't know which is which. I don't care. Right? Well, actually, no. I, no. Let me take that back. I made a pair of diastereomers. I didn't talk about the enantiomers. So I should probably do that. It'll just confuse things, but... So actually, there are four possible products I could have made in this reaction. Two enantiomers for each of the two 
additions. So the enantiomer of this molecule is going to be what? I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to I'm going to invert both chiral centers to make the enantiomer. So here is that molecule's enantiomer. The one that I just made 100% because I added 100% cis. Except what did I do? I screwed up this. It should look like that. So when I made this molecule at 100%, I made that diastereomer 100% versus this one zero. But along with this, if this is like a D and this is an L, those are going to be equal. So the reason that this reaction is stereoselective is because I selected one of two diastereomers. I did not select between those two enantiomers. Those two enantiomers are still going to be there. So this product would actually not rotate plane polarized light because it's going to be a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. Because I didn't select one enantiomer over another because I didn't use a chiral reagent. And that's the problem with chiral molecules. In order to make one, you need to use one. So that's so that this reaction is stereoselective, but the reactions we're going to to do are going to be stereoselective simply because I'm going to make one diastereomer over another. And why did I make one diastereomer over another? Because the reagent was either 100% cis or 100% trans, and that's what's going to make one diastereomer over another. So if the reaction is 50-50, it ain't stereoselective. It can't be. But of course, I still need to make two different products. Because if I don't make two different products, I'm not going to get a stereoselective reaction. So you will see stereoselectivity in the context of rings most of the time. And all of the time for today and tomorrow. So now I can make an H and an OH Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. The, the added advantage of making an anti-Markovnikov is I now have control to add the H and the OH cis. Can I, make, can I do this anti-Markovnikov and make the H and the OH trans? No. Not yet. Or at all. So are there other reagents that we have to talk about? Yes. We have to add BRs. We have to add a BR and an OH. We have to add an H and an OH by another mechanism that will add trans. We could add two H's, two OH's, and then we could split the double bond apart. But that's the rest of chapter 12. So does this last reaction make sense? 
Actually, what it'll do is it'll just replace the BH2 with an OH. Wherever the original H went from the BH3, it stays there. So all it does is just replace the boron with an OH in exactly the same position. Okay with that because that's going to be where it ends for tomorrow. Now, in terms of tomorrow being totally comprehensive, what are we looking at in terms of topics? Well, I I, I actually I wasn't kidding yesterday when I said if you go back through your notes you'll be able to create a list of topics. I did I did I did modify the final for you guys last night. And I didn't bring it with me so I could read the list of topics off of it. But what kinds of things do you think you'll have to do? Let's go back to the beginning. This is not, disclaimer, this is not a comprehensive list because I may miss something. But we started with like Lewis dot structures and then we went into resonance structures. Could you, could you identify, you know, the most stable resonance structure from a list using the charges, um, et cetera? Could you identify the hybridization of carbons or oxygens? And again, we didn't deal with bent. We didn't deal with, you know, seesaw. We dealt strictly with linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral. And actually then if we had to go into expanded octets, it would be, um, for, for things like sulfur, it would be trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral. Okay. We did a little bit on physical properties in terms of intermolecular forces, um, but then we spent a good amount of time on naming alkanes and alkenes, naming them from the naming aspect of them, naming them from EZ, naming them from cis-trans, and naming alkanes, just naming cycloalkanes as well as regular alkanes. So will you have to, you know, be able to do all that? Yes. Then we got into the good stuff like cyclohexane chairs, Newman projections. I could give you a list of Newman projections and say which one is the most stable, or I could say rank them. I could give you a chair confirmation and say, well, the trick that people like to do with, with chair confirmations is, and I think you'll see that in, if you looked at some of the problems that I wrote as practice problems, I'll usually say, what's the most stable confirmation, chair confirmation of like trans something? Well, if I give you four of those, two of them are cis, and only two of them are trans, so the two cis's don't count, right? Because I said trans. So the one with the two acts, with the one with the two groups equatorial, that may not be the correct answer because I may have asked for the other one, which doesn't have that combination. So you always have to check and make sure the molecule is the correct molecule. That, that, that goes for a Newman projection as well. So I'll give you those hints. Um, but will you have to you know, rank Newman projections? Yes. 
chair conformations, what's the most stable, or rank those. Um, RNS of tetrahedron, Newman projections, chairs, and um, fissures. So I could give you a molecule and say, is this R or S? Most likely what I'll give you is one with two chiral centers and say, is it R, 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 S, S, R, S, S? Um, how many stereoisomers are, sorry, can you identify chiral carbons in a molecule? We did a little bit of that. Same meso diastereomers, same not meso. I can give you a couple molecules and ask you for the chemical relationships. Uh, what else? And then, then we're up to SN1, SN2, E1, E2. So what are, the, what are the characteristics of those reactions? Know your chart. Which, ones, which solvents cause the reaction to go faster or slower? But in order to do that, you've got to get your mechanism. So that's why you need to know your chart. And it is SN1 plus E at this point. Yeah, I would keep them separate. I would keep them separate. While the second half of an SN1 reaction is the same as the addition, I would keep them separate because the chart, the little chart we created today is the overall reaction, which is not SN1 or SN2. So, E2s. Right, if you give you a cyclohexane ring with the groups being bold dashed, leaving group bolder dashed, could, if I gave you E1, can you write the major product of that? Can you write the major product? If I said it's going to be E2 with NH2 minus or E2 with peroxide or with a terse butoxide. And the mechanisms I could give you all this I could give you all the transition states and intermediates of a mechanism and say order them. I could give you some and say which ones are correct, which ones are wrong. Like if we have five bonds to a carbon. Not partial bonds in, in an SN2 transition state, but five bonds to a carbon. That's probably going to be wrong. Okay. So, I mean, it's going to be... It's just going to be a multiple-choice format of, of what we've gone through with the last four exams. So, you have the practice exam... You have the practice exam that you can, um, well, practice problems you can use. Because when I write those, I write them very similarly to what I've written. Yeah. It's in the last folder, yeah. So numbers one through seven are enolate reactions that we will get to next semester. So you don't well. If you can do them, great. But you know you're you're a full semester ahead then. So when I first did this years ago, I took the last two days of the class in the second semester, and basically the first day I just handed out that problem set, and the first set of problems was the was um, enolate chemistry. And then there was a second set of problems I handed out the second day that dealt with second semester. So that's why those problems are in the first semester, is because I did that. And that was a, probably the only time that I did it in class because what happened was people hadn't really started preparing for the final exam, so I went around and answered questions, but it was mostly like a sort of a shock, like, oh, this is all the stuff that I don't remember. 
so then I just put it online and say here's something you can use to prepare for the final. The final Yeah, you can write stuff on the exam. This is this is I'll give you as much scrap paper as you want. You gotta hand it in. And it's a Scantron, so you're gonna fill out a Scantron. Will be like I think it's seventy four questions. I just put in as the point total a hundred just because it's gonna be somewhere close to that. Or not. Sometimes sometimes the exams get up into the couple hundred point range. They haven't this semester. But they have it here. But sometimes they get it at like two two forty. That's usually the upper limit of whether people can finish it or not. I probably underestimated a little bit this this time. But you'll have the full time because there's nothing else we're gonna do except take the final. And I don't think I unmuted the last exam, so I'll have to do that. So that's what I can that's what I can tell you the other questions. Chapter 11 is for your own review, and what I'm going to say is for chapter 12, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to count those. So if you want to do them, you can do them as practice on your own. So I am I am going to go back and and record the scores for chapter 10. So if you haven't completed chapter 10, you know, it would be good review for the final. But if not, I would get to them by like. Friday night, because that's when I'm going to go back through and score and put those scores into Canvas. I thought I did. So which which ones? Oh, it's still chapter ten has to be done. All right, I'll unmute it. I'll unmute it. Um, I'll unmute it. I'll unmute it in a few minutes. Okay. So, here's where here's what we're going to do. I have given you one graded problem set so far, which was 10% of the grade. Which may be good or may be bad. So, I have a second graded problem set that is worth 20 points just like the first one. So, what I will do is don't tell any of the students in first or second semester here during the year because they'll because this is not the way the class normally operates during the regular season. They will be angry. Not that I can't handle that, but I they'll be they'll be like well, you you know, you gave extra credit. After telling freshmen, after telling new freshman students on Monday, on a slide that says, "Don't ask for extra credit because you're never going to get it." You got in high school, you're never going to get in college. So I violated my own rule. Um, so what I have is a graded set. I will take the higher of the two scores, and so what I will let you do is, and you can work on this in, in a group if you would like. But I will give you this. There are three problems, and then you can turn it in when you're done. I'll post the answer to you. If you got 20 out of 20 on your first, on your first one, then I guess you can just take it into the no. Um, I would say it still is going to be pretty good practice. Four questions I'm going to ask on the final, but then this way, I mean, the problem is I need to lose one point. It takes total 20 points. 
It's a total of 20 points, so there's three questions. There's three questions. There's one on the back. So let's figure they're about, two of them are worth seven and one of them is worth six. And you have to be really calculating to try and figure out exactly which question to answer to get exactly how many points that you need. Alex. So for, yes, for number two and for number three, I would like you to write, actually for number three, so let's start with number three first. I'd like you to write the major product and the mechanism of that reaction. Now granted, we just did this one yesterday, your notes might be helpful in terms of going back through the steps that we did yesterday on that. If your notes don't have that, then why not? <laughs> but also, I posted the notes every day in the canvas so you can find it there. So for that one, no transition states. Number three, you don't have to put transition states because we didn't go over the transition states. So just the step, just the intermediates and the steps. For number two, write the complete mechanism. I want to see it all for that. So you're adding H plus CH3OH. And then for the first one, there's a molecule. For A, write the products, maybe under A, all the possible products, or the possible products with the major product being circled. Or it just says major products. That's fine. You can write the major products under A for an E1, under B for using NH2 minus and C using tertiary toxide. And then if you have any questions, you can, I'm going to sit here. I may walk around. But if you have any questions, you can certainly ask. And we can go over it. And if you want me to take a look at it, if you want me to take a look at it before you finally hand it in, I'll do that too. Remember, this is small points. What I'm hoping is, you know, let's work it out so tomorrow you get the big points when it comes to these.